Between 2012 and 2021, there were 353,000 fires in homes across America, another 117,000 in other buildings, and hundreds of thousands of vehicle fires and fires outdoors. During that time, home fires alone caused nearly 3,000 deaths, more than 11,000 injuries, and over $8 trillion in damage. There are roughly 27,000 fire departments across the country, with about 52,000 stations among them. In these station garages are estimated to be an array of about 200,000 firefighting trucks. A single fire truck can cost up to $2.5 million. And in the US, this company is the biggest maker of them. The Wisconsin-based brand is a subsidiary of Oshkosh Corporation, a sort of superstore of purpose-built vehicles. Need a news van, mail truck, garbage truck, construction lift? Oshkosh makes all of them. We serve people in our communities who are doing the toughest work, really hard work, dangerous work. Now, the company is electrifying, but that comes as the company faces severe failures elsewhere. Defense makes up a quarter of its revenue, and the company recently lost a $9 billion contract that made up more than half of that. Probably makes sense for them to de-emphasize defense because quite frankly, the people who want to invest in electrification and decarbonization generally don't love defense businesses. As the leading maker of the 28 companies that belong to the Fire Apparatus Manufacturers Association, Pierce has been making fire trucks since 1939. Its designs and innovations are largely responsible for the modern fire engine as we know it. The chevron striping you see on the back of fire trucks was first featured in an early Pierce product. In 1958, the company made the first fire truck with an articulating boom called a snorkel. The following year, sales topped $1 million for the first time. Over the decades, the company has made key innovations in every part of the vehicle. Now, Pierce has made what it says is North America's first zero emission fire truck. No mean feat given the fact that large vehicles are considered the toughest to electrify due to the sheer size of the battery needed. What we're addressing uniquely with the electric vehicle space with our solution is it's a North American style fire apparatus that doesn't change the way in which the trucks operate, the way they're used, and largely the way they're serviced. Each fire truck is custom made. Depending on the type, a single vehicle can take about 11 to 14 weeks to build, from the time the factory first starts cutting sheet metal to the time it is ready for customer pickup. The total paint catalog numbers 987 different colors, including more than 300 shades of red. There is a multitude of custom chassis and a complex supply chain that can offer all kinds of options in drivetrains, axles, pumps, lighting systems, and whatever else. Given that amount of variability, it does create a uniqueness to our business and how we have to operate, how we have to design, how we have to manufacture, as well as how we have to service those apparatus in the field. Oshkosh was founded by two entrepreneurs in 1917. They patented inventions for four-wheel drive vehicles, but continuous rejection by automakers forced the two to go into business for themselves. More than 100 years later, Oshkosh Corporation still makes vehicles. A few key pieces of technology tie a lot of its various product lines together. For example, most of the products it sells make use of hydraulic lifts in one way or another. While serving about 20 different end markets makes the business more complex, it has advantages. The company can use the same piece of electrification technology on a postal vehicle that it uses on a construction lift. It can use autonomous tech on an airport vehicle or a garbage or recycling truck. Between 2002 and 2022, company sales grew from $1.7 billion to $8.3 billion. Its biggest customers are primarily municipal governments, but it also serves airports, the Department of Defense, large industrial companies, universities, and international markets. We deal with so many various suppliers that, that we still stumble across those one-offs. So we still muscle through those things. The strategies in which we're employing are, are things like dual sourcing. We're, we're promoting those suppliers ourselves that actually have a consistent delivery schedule. 
you know, we know which suppliers are gonna create problems for us. We know which ones are, are gonna help us. Despite high inflation and supply chain shortages resulting from the pandemic, the company is confident about its prospects. In 2022, it had a record order backlog worth $14.1 billion. It is expecting close to $10 billion in revenue in 2023. We've shown that we've gotten through the supply chain difficulties. The throughputs in our plants are much better. Our earnings this year, our current guidance is $8 per share. It was a tough situation, but we've proven we could get through it uh, and that'll continue. Oshkosh has four segments. The access equipment business, construction lifts and telescoping forklifts and towing and recovering vehicles. It made up nearly half of net sales in 2022. Defense makes up the second biggest chunk of the business. And then there is the commercial segment, dump trucks, garbage trucks, cement mixers, and others. At the same time, Oshkosh has suffered some setbacks. Most recently, it lost a $9 billion contract to make the Next Generation Joint Light Tactical Vehicle, or JLTV, a kind of multi-purpose military vehicle. The JLTV program comprised more than half of Oshkosh's annual defense revenues. Production is expected to end in 2024. We weren't willing to, to supply the contract at zero or negative margin. That's not the type of business that we run, and that's why we, we didn't win the contract. The U.S. government's a shrinking portion of our, of our uh, revenue right now purely because presidential budgets are not uh, appropriating as much money as they had been before to core tactical wheeled vehicles that the Department of Defense buys. Its defense programs have single digit operating margins, making them the least profitable portion of Oshkosh's portfolio, and a reason why some investors think defense isn't worth holding on to anymore. The investors who value decarbonization and sustainability are looking for electric vehicle plays, but those are not generally the same people who want to make investments in defense businesses. You're working at cross purposes here where you have something that sustainability investors really value highly paired with something that they actually try to avoid. The company says it plans on bidding on government contracts coming out of the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, signed into law by President Biden in 2022. These have boosted demand for the company's purpose-built construction lifts and other vehicles. Any new technology, and, and, and especially in our space, you have your traditionalists and then you have your early adopters. We're going through that early adopter phase, but the demand is strong. The interest is high. Oshkosh is spreading electrification to areas of its portfolio beyond the Pierce brand and the postal delivery vehicles. One example is the electrified version of the Striker, an airport rescue and firefighting vehicle. Nobody ever thought you could electrify an 80,000 pound vehicle. We've done it, we're taking orders for it right now all over the world. Offsetting some of the lost business in the defense sector is the contract the company won to produce the USPS's next generation delivery vehicle. It is planning for a production ramp in the second half of 2024. The total contract is for up to 165,000 units. Any company trying to electrify will face the usual challenges, such as figuring out how their customers are going to charge. Construction sites, for example, tend not to have a lot of spare electricity supplies. So the company is developing mobile recharging equipment that can be brought to a work site. Pierce's Volterra fire truck has a backup diesel engine, but is designed to meet its daily duty cycle on electric power. We've had multiple in service. We've had one in service for over two years in Madison, Wisconsin. That truck has gone on thousands of calls and the battery life has never been an issue. They've operated it under full battery that entire two years essentially was never dropping below 40%. There's a fair amount of their served end markets that are gonna electrify over the next 10 or 15 years. They're fairly well positioned to make that transition because they don't have a ton of really big global competitors. They're very niche end markets that they operate in. They tend to be the market leader in most of those. Those end markets electrify. I think these guys have an interesting opportunity to lead that charge. 